The Tom Woods Show, episode 2046. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. I am joined today by Jake Whiskershin and Mike Sodini with Walk the Talk America. I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you guys in just a minute. But Walk the Talk America, which you can reach at WTTA. Dot org describes itself this way. Walk the Talk America believes that by improving the quality and availability of mental health resources to gun owners, we can reduce suicide by firearm. We are paving the way by educating mental health professionals about gun culture and breaking negative stigmas around mental health for gun owners. I would say they are also breaking stigmas around gun owners for mental health professionals, which is also important. So let's turn to them now. All right, let's start off with uh, both of you guys maybe giving the audience your backgrounds. I was a little thin on the bios because I wanted to give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves. So, Jake, you want to go first? I don't mind at all. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Big fan, big fan of Liberty, and you've been a guiding light, so I appreciate that. Thank you. So the last name is pronounced Wiskirchen, as introduced, and I'm a marriage and family therapist by trade in the state of Nevada. I'm a national certified counselor. I co-own a Oh, I don't co-own anymore. I just uh, bought out my business partner. So I own and operate an outpatient counseling practice called Zephyr Wellness here in Northern Nevada. And I've been doing that for coming up on seven years now. I wear a lot of different hats in the community, serve on various boards and organizations and coalitions and so forth. But uh, why we're here today is because of Walk the Talk America. And Mike will talk more about that when he introduced himself. But I'm basically the mental health of the guns and mental health part of what we do. And as a firearms owning clinician, I uh, believe it's important to bring a voice to uh, bring the two cultures together. So we'll get more into that, but uh, I'll kick it over to Mike and he can introduce himself. Well, hang, hang on, just before we do that, when you say Northern Nevada, do you mean like somewhere around Reno? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a fifth generation Renoite. My mom's family has been here forever. And my dad's actually from the east side of the state in Ely, but we live in, we live in Sparks and you know, Reno Sparks, broader Northern Oh, Nevada. okay, because I just visited Reno last year for the first time ever, and I went to, there was a beautiful little Sparks farmer's market that we went to while we were there. Uh-huh. I went to an event at the Reno Events Center and then made the long, long, uneventful drive down to Vegas <laughs> from <laughs> Reno. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a drive I was supposed to make this week because SHOT Show is going on in Vegas where Mike is. He's down in the southern part of the state, and uh, that drive is boring. It is... Uh, it is not. We had plenty of music to keep us <laughs> keep us company. All right, Mike, let's turn it over to you. Uh, introduce yourself to the folks. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Michael Sedini, and I'm a third generation firearms industry expert. I'm not necessarily what you'd call the the typical gun guy. I grew up in two of the worst places to grow up for guns. I grew up in uh, Jersey and uh, San Francisco, California. So guns were not part of my life every day. We didn't go hunting. We did things like that. But I got into the industry after I graduated from college because of nepotism, which I recommend for anybody because it's just the the best way to go. But uh, it gave me an opportunity to go into an industry I knew nothing about, but I also didn't have any prejudice against it. It's something that has provided for my family for years. And one thing I did notice over the years is that there are certain aspects when it comes to suicide in the firearms industry that we kind of pass the ball to mental health because we fear that things will be weaponized against us. So in 2018, I had an opportunity to start a nonprofit organization where we look for innovative ways to get people the help they need when they're in crisis without fear of consequence and nothing to do with legislation, right? So the theory was, you know, everybody says we need to do something, whether it's about a mass shooter or it's about suicide. And what is that something? We've never been able to come up with it. One side always says, or restriction and taking away guns. The other one's like, you figure it out, right? We are that something. So I started that in 2018, and now here we are today. So, Yeah, I've been looking at your site and reading about what you guys have been up to and what you've managed to accomplish over the course of just over three years. Very impressive. I didn't know about it until you guys wrote to me. And I said to my assistant, well, listen, you go check this website out. And if it looks any good, get back to me and we'll we'll get them on. And the response I got was, wow, wow, wow. You absolutely have to have these people on. Oh, okay, all right. So then I took a look and said, yes, <laughs> this one is an absolute definite. So I don't know the details and I'm sure it's different by state, but 
Are there restrictions on gun ownership if you have some kind of mental health problem or you come forward and say you have a mental health problem? Do your gun rights get stripped from you? Well, they can be. It's like states like New York, yes, that's a very big issue. Other states, not so much. And that's one of the things we want to do is educate people and demystify the counseling process for them so they understand that they can go forward. And we also educate mental health clinicians on gun culture, right? But it's something to where, because there is a narrative that was created inside the gun industry that all people on the mental health side are gun grabbers and they're just waiting for you to say something. And then they, as Jake would say, they have a bat phone to the government and your guns are gone. And that's worked against us sometimes because we use this term called before stage four, right? And if you're afraid to go get help and you just kind of bottle it up, you eventually will hit stage four. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And one of the things I want to make clear is we're not sitting here saying that we can stop all suicide, right? But what we're trying to do is do our best to stop as many suicides by firearm that we can. So that's where we're at. And in the course of stopping suicide by firearm, the presumption is we're stopping the suicide period by getting the person the necessary help. But here's my main question. If the key indicator of future violence is past violence, as I read you saying somewhere, and it's not, let's say, mental illness or something, but it's rather that you have engaged in violence in the past, wouldn't the past violence preclude your owning a firearm in the first place so the question would be moot? Yeah, I think usually. And Mike's probably better equipped to answer that because he comes from the industry, but I'll speak on behalf of the professional community here as clinicians. That presumes a documentation, right? That somebody has engaged in a violent act and then was prosecuted for it Mm -hmm. up to the felony level. And I draw that analog to something in the clinical realm where people want to you know, point to some, uh, you know, tragic outcome, a mass shooting, a school shooting, a suicide, and they go, well, look at all the signs. It was all there, but it wasn't mental illness, right? It's like, well, maybe it was, but it wasn't diagnosed. That's a documentation issue. If the person never got treatment, then there was no paperwork trail. Similarly, if you'd never get caught with your violence, then there's no paperwork trail. And you're not going to get caught in that that screening methodology that, you know, you go through the, the NICS check or whatever it is. So, but Mike, having dealt with this in the in the forums that everybody has to fill out in the retail stores, I think he's probably better equipped to handle that. Well, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. When I first got into this, I, I was like a sponge, right? Because I was learning from all these mental health professionals. And I used to say, like, if it's not mental illness, what is it? And Jake makes a great point by saying, look, undiagnosed. So there's a lot of nuance here. There's a lot of levels to this, right? But think about... A lot of times it's a judgment call as well. We've heard of situations where clinicians didn't report something or didn't say something because it's a fine line to walk, right? You don't want to necessarily take away somebody's right. You know, you could take 10 people that have bipolar disorder, hand them a firearm. They'll go their whole life without hurting a fly, right? I could come home one day and catch my wife in bed with my best friend and and snap, you know? So it's a difficult thing to just pinpoint to or just say, hey, it's all mental health. Right. But clearly, when someone does something really strange, right, you either say it's it's just pure evil or there's a mental health issue. Now, I want to know, I want you to tell everybody exactly, specifically what it is your organization does to try to help people who need help and how it is that you brought together specifically the mental health community and the gun industry. Like, what specific things do you guys do? I'm going to start off, Jake, and then I'll pass it to you when we get to our cultural competence course. But when I first started, the whole idea was I wanted to throw money at the problem because I thought, well, I'll just backtrack. So when I got the idea for the organization, it was by a chance meeting with somebody at a dinner table that didn't even know anything about the gun industry nor the mental health industry. But she said, what happens during a mass shooting? And I said, well, they they blame us. Everybody blames us, which is the gun industry, right? And we blame mental health. And then nothing ever happens. And she asked one question. She said, uh, if you've identified what the issue is, how do you work hand in hand with the mental health community? And uh, my national sales manager and I were celebrating, so we were a little in it. But uh, he he looked at me and he said, you know what, Mike, you should donate a dollar a gun to mental health. And I thought, well, that's a great idea, right? I'd always heard that the mental health community was always underfunded. And I thought, well, what if some of that money can come from the gun manufacturers where we can say, hey, what are those solutions? What can we do? Turns out, when I started reaching out to the mental health community, they didn't have the answers. 
right? And that's where, you know, you made the point about finding needle in the haystack. There's no future predictor of violence. Like minority report movie does not exist in real life. So it was a real eye opener for me. So it was almost depressing, right? Because I had this like grandiose idea that, hey, we're going to give them money. We're going to be heroes and we're going to save lives. And it forced me to look back into the industry and say, okay, if there's no easy answer for this, and we have to focus on suicide prevention, not mass shooters, what can the gun industry do? And the first thing that I did was I created bands that led to free and anonymous mental health screenings that are powered by our partner, Mental Health America. And I was passing them out at gun shows like SHOT Show and the NRA Show, and just trying to, to feel the reaction that I was getting from the crowd. And it was amazing because people were opening up and saying that for far too long, gun owners haven't been able to come forward and talk about their mental health. So I took it a step further. And I said, well, what if I put free and anonymous mental health screenings in the boxes of the firearms that I import from all over the world? And I wanted to test it out to see what the reaction was. And we were getting calls that said, hey, I bought one of your guns and I saw this mental health screening and I just want to say thank you. This is awesome. So I said, okay, let's take it a step further. There's no pushback from the industry. Seems like people enjoy it. And then I started walking up to you know, my industry peers, people like Arms Corps and High Point, other gun manufacturers. And I'm like, hey, would you mind putting this card in the boxes of your gun? Or, what is it? Freedom Anonymous Mental Health Screenings. Like, this is a great idea. And it's kind of like, who knew all you had to do was ask. And you know, these screenings are great because, and there's like 13 different ones everything from anxiety to substance abuse to depression, and they're anonymous. And that's what gun owners want, right? And screenings allow you to check in on yourself. You don't have to be in crisis to take a screening that's good to take just to see where you're at mentally. But it was little things like that. Working with safe manufacturers to find innovative technology that will help people in crisis. There's a lot of stuff that you can unpack on our website, and I know we're on a time crunch. But one of the things I'm most proud of is what I'm going to have Jake talk about next, which is our cultural competence course for mental health clinicians. Yeah, so uh, I've hosted a podcast called Noggin Notes, which is just a mental health podcast where I interview people for uh, coming up on five years now. And back in 2019, I was engaged in a text exchange with a friend of mine here who operates his mother's gun store called Reno Guns and Range. It's an indoor range, one of our premier facilities. And uh, Jordan and I had gone back and forth for years about like, how do we combine these two cultures? And finally, he shoots me a text one day. He's like, well, have you heard of Walk the Talk America? I said, no, I haven't. So I, I uh, immediately Googled them. I uh, put that in air quotes for the uh, listening audience who can't see me. Uh, so them turns out to be Mike, basically running a one-man show. And I said, hey, would you guys like to be on my podcast to talk about this guns and mental health thing and how you're doing it? So he agrees. He comes on the show. We talk. We become BFFs after like three hours of conversation. And at that particular time, I was uh, chairing my licensing board here in the state. So it's a little weird being a you know, liberty-minded person chairing a state regulatory authority. <laughs> but but uh, I realized I had all this connectivity to different occupational licensing boards, particularly in the mental health realm. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we taught cultural competence courses to clinicians so that we demystify what it means to be a gun owner and we we ourselves as professionals aren't chasing people away with awkward, clumsy, fumbling conversations about firearms while we're in session with you know, people who are in crisis or some lady who's depressed or some veteran with PTSD or, or just this couple with an angsty teenager who you know, got his heart broken by his girlfriend and they have, they have guns in the home, right? I wanted us as a profession to be much more competent in having that, that conversation. So what I arranged for was continuing education credit for social workers, psychologists, clinical mental health professionals, marriage and family therapists, uh, drug and alcohol counselors. And then later on, we ended up doing some stuff for medical physicians and nurses. So our courses that are on our website that you can download for free and watch and then uh, take a little survey and you'll get a certificate spit out to you saying that you completed it. Those are usually good for continuing ed credit for your license renewals. And I'm very, very proud of that. The first class we did was at Reno Guns and Range. We got I don't know, 12 or 14 people. And then we did another one a few months later. We did the same thing, 12 or 14 people. And we had one scheduled for Vegas in March of 20. And then the world ended, unfortunately. So yeah. everybody shifted to online. And what that created was actually a, a great opportunity for us to reach more people. Because it turns out not everybody wants to go to a gun range to take a, a mental health competence course. But if they can do it from the comfort and safety of their own home, 
uh, it gives them a little bit of an arm's length exposure. And so the next course we did was online and it was hosted through a department at the University of Nevada, which also gave us greater exposure. We ended up getting a bunch of people from across the country to tune in. And uh, we got 74 people to attend. And then we did it again. We got 236. And so the numbers just kept climbing. Now we've we've gotten to the point where we've touched you know, more than 400 people with this cultural competence training for mental health and healthcare practitioners. Now you flip that coin. And the other side of that is to bring counseling services to firearms owners to demystify what we do as counseling professionals and say, hey, look, it's not something of the occult. You don't have to be scared of it. It's not some dude behind a curtain pulling levers. This is accessible to everyone, right? And we're not going to stigmatize you. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to pick up the bat phone to the government and take your property away. So I think what we've done is very, very practical. It's very tangible. You know, the flyers in the boxes, the wristbands, the cultural competence courses, and then the trainings that we take out into the community. We went to a train and learn event that a guy in our you know, firearms community, Kevin Dixie, put on in Missouri last year. And uh, there's 75, 80 people there, you know, all firearms owners there to get firearms training. And we talked to them about mental health and it was great. Like, it's been so great. I, I'm very proud of what we do. Well, I don't know that this is how you would necessarily put it, but in these courses, are you kind of trying to overturn some of the stereotypes people might have about gun owners? Yes, absolutely. And I think it's very powerful that we have not just Mike to represent his purpose and mission and vision for the organization. But me, I, I come in and I teach about you know suicide intervention and we go over some statistics, but then we have a firearms instructor. Often it's Rob Pincus, who's one of our board members, but we did a presentation up in Oregon that was an all-day training. We used uh, Derek LeBlanc, who is, he founded and runs Kids Safe Foundation. So he teaches kids firearm safety. But what we do is we do like a Guns 101 hands-on experience. So the virtual version is Rob holding firearms on the screen saying, this is a rifle, this is a pistol, this is the caliber of bullet that you use, and so on and so forth. And he goes through a lot of the cultural experiences that people you know, encounter when they're in the firearms community. And he analogizes it to um, car culture, which I think is very appropriate. There's a lot of parallels there. And you can, you know, I don't have to bend everybody's ear here, you can watch the videos on the website for free and and see what I'm talking about. But but yes, that's exactly what we do. We we say, hey, look, this is a demographic that you need to be aware of, you as you know the practicing clinician, because we got some research that suggests that uh, 47% of Americans either own a gun or live with somebody who does. So ostensibly, that's half your clientele. Like one out of every two people walk through your door is either going to own a gun or live with one. And obviously that goes up for various geographic regions too. Like here in Nevada, it's way higher than half. So we can't afford to be ignorant about this. And I think we need to bring that experience practically into the hands of the the practitioner. All right, Mike, what's your angle on this? I mean, what I'm ultimately trying to do is bring two cultures together that historically stood across the hall from each other and wouldn't talk and, and don't understand each other in many instances. But I want to get the firearms industry where the alcohol industry got with DUIs. Right? Nobody blames Johnny Walker when somebody gets behind the wheel and does something tragic. And it could be the same for the firearms industry. We spent so much time reeling and saying, pry it from my cold, dead hands. You know, and that's rightfully so, right? So there's a lot of things that <laughs> I've been called personally from people that didn't understand the, the firearms community. And I think we, we've sort of forgotten that we could hit it head on and get ahead of it, get upstream to prevent the unpredictable and control it ourselves, right? We can control those narratives and we can make sure that freedom is the most important thing in this process. And at the same time, getting people the help they need when they're in crisis. So that's what my angle is. That's really what I'm trying to do. And uh, it's been a wild three-year ride. You know, when I, like I guess when I first started this, I never would have guessed that we'd be here now, but we really have made a difference. And one of the things that I would like to throw in here is like, In 2019, I was invited to the White House to be on the Suicide Prevention Task Force for the VA. And one thing I noticed about that was I was the only person for the firearms industry in that room, right? You have all these brilliant minds, 30 different doctors. And what I said to them is, the firearms industry can help you. We can help you, but you can't make us a bad guy anymore. You have to work with us and you have to work within the parameters that we can set. We have valuable space. We have gun shops, we have trainers. We have gun boxes, you know, firearms boxes. 
there's a lot of space that we can give people help. So that's what my angle is in this. All right, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsor, Blinkist. Now, I know you've heard me talk about Blinkist before, but listen to me, I'm about to make your life and your brain much better. Now, it's true, by now, many of you know that Blinkist is an app that takes thousands of important nonfiction titles and summarizes them for you in 15-minute so-called blinks that you can either read or listen to. This means they get rid of all the fluff and give you just what you need to know. And you may find you want to read that whole book. You may also find this book would be a waste of my time. Blinkist offers titles on all different subjects from all different perspectives. They even have a book by me, Meltdown. They have Murray Rothbard's For a New Liberty or Economic Facts and Fallacies by Thomas Sowell. Go read that book, then listen to the blink, and the information will stay in your head more effectively. Honestly, I think Sowell is one of the best writers I have ever come across, and he has such a sharp mind, and he's such a great economist, and Blinkist gives you a great way to get your feet wet with Thomas Sowell's material. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. Jake, I'm sure that in your clinical practice, you see people whose progress is evident to you as the week's progress. And and you can really see tangibly that you, in conjunction with that person, have really helped to make things better. In a case like this, where you're dealing anonymously with a large group of people, you don't even know the people you're reaching, it's harder to know exactly what kind of impact you're having, except when they submit their own stories. So I see that you actually have a section on this. Would you mind sharing some examples of this? Not at all. In fact, one that I don't know that we've posted is there's a guy from back east who was one of the first people we touched by this. He, he discovered us through some social media channel and and reached out and said that we were influential in helping normalize his experience and so forth. And from that, it was really cool to watch the ripple effect because we've corresponded quite a bit. And And he says, I've become a better dad. I've become a better husband. My kids are successful. They're off to college now. And the before picture of that was not. It was chaotic, turbulent. He was dealing with anger issues, lots of stress. And I I don't have to go into specifics, but these types of anecdotes come through with such frequency and regularity that we know that we're doing good, right? It's really frustrating to work in this profession, especially when people don't return for their next session and you go, ah, they're probably okay. And we can't quantify it. And so we're just going to have to close out the file if we don't see them for 90 days or whatever and pray. But what it teaches us is to be non-attached to the outcomes and just have a lot of faith that what we're doing is actually working and hang our hats on the anecdotes that we do here. So through the course of the last couple of years, the one that, that I just mentioned is very powerful, of course, but we've also had people reach out and say, hey, I'd love to contribute. How do I help? What do you need from me? And to those people, I'd say the exhortation is just to talk about it more. You know, Mike's dream is that the gun industry would take this on itself without being compelled by .gov to make it do something, right? And um, my dream is to get practitioners comfortable enough to the point where they also, like I came out of the closet as a firearms only clinician, they can also come and say, hey, I'm I'm a Second Amendment supporter. I'm a 2A ally. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a freedom lover. We're not all wokists living in the, in the shadows or whatever. And that sends a signal to broader clientele or broader market population that you can come to therapy and we're not going to like put some woo-woo on you, right? We're going to meet you where you are and truly walk you through this. Because as I see it, the suspicion doesn't end with the gun community. Suspicion about counseling and the stigma that associates with it extends to almost all first responders and anybody with a job where their competence could reasonably be questioned or their efficacy could be questioned if they're deemed to be struggling with a mental illness. So that's police, that's emergency medicine physicians, that's attorneys, it's plumbers and pipe fitters. I mean, it's anybody with a culture that says, don't go get help, just white knuckle it through, right? And if they don't get help, things get worse. And what does worse look like? Well, it could end up in in the form of suicide, but ultimately like it's reconciling marriages and and becoming better parents and providing loving, warm, 
you know, areas for your kids to grow up in. And, and I want to work myself out of a job, you know, so I, I want to put this information out there. I want to teach people about emotional functioning. That's why we do podcasts and YouTube videos and all that stuff. Because I want people to take this and run with it. Because if I can work myself out of a job, I'd happily do anything to pay my bills. If it means that I am living in a community where people are healthy and happy and my kids aren't getting dirt thrown in their faces on the playground, and I don't have to watch couples arguing in the line at the grocery store. You know, if everybody's happy and healthy and I don't have anything to do anymore as a mental health practitioner, then great. But we got to get people in the door first. And even if they don't want to come in the door, that's fine too. I've got tons of information. There's lots of books to be read and consumed out there. So it is working. And I don't know that I need the empirical evidence to tell me that it's working because we're seeing it, right? Mike can attest to the culture that shifted throughout the 2A community just in the short couple of years that I've been around. The stories are very powerful. Yeah, don't let data get in the way of saving lives. That's one of the lines I always use with a lot of the uh, the professors and everybody that I cross paths with. You know, we need to get the firearms industry to be proactive. And, and you know, like one example is we have an ammunition manufacturer that's putting the screenings on the side of the box. This stuff doesn't hurt. People need to know where they need to go. And they want it to come from a trusted source. I'm looking at your website right now. So it's I guess there are two ways to do it. So the easy way is WTTA.org, which is walkthetalkamerica.org, which you can also get to. You can also just do walkthetalkamerica.org or WTTA.org, bridging the gap between mental health and responsible firearm ownership. Lots of great resources here, podcasts, your um, flyers and stuff. Jake, you were saying about people saying, what can I do to help you? And you were saying, talk more. What else can folks do? I mean, we've got the website here. Obviously, they can contribute to you guys. Yeah, we'll always take money. I mean, that, and I don't say that at all tongue in cheek. It's been very hard for us to ask for money. I think like most people, you just believe in your products such that you just have faith that financing will come through at some point or another. We've had to turn the corner on willingly asking for it. Like just saying, this isn't free. I'm blessed enough to have a group of employees that generates my salary for me so I can go off and do this kind of philanthropic stuff. Mike doesn't. He sold off his part of the family company to focus on Walk the Talk and and, um, he's still working on the side. So it would be great if we got donations to help fund us. It'd be even better if we got the big manufacturers to kick down. Ruger just donated $25,000, which is amazing. We need to make it sustainable because this work is very important. But as far as individuals, when I say talk about it, I mean actually put your name on it. I espouse my opinions loudly and online, but they're they're loudly and well informed. And I don't really worry about the cancel mob coming for me because I believe that, like I referenced earlier, the market will decide whether or not the message is is worthwhile. You know, and so I think this is just so important. And we we've left so many people in the shadows that the only way that we're going to bring sunlight to it is if individuals do it themselves individually and start saying, yes, I also advocate for this organization. When you, when you donate, you get a bracelet. You can get a wristband and you know wear that around. You know, it says, take a free and anonymous mental health screening today. It has nothing to do with guns, right? <laughs> like, so get yourself checked. Free and anonymous is great. The metrics are great. They're, you know, the instruments are high fidelity. They're powered by Mental Health America, so we know they're good. That's what you can do practically. Just just start talking about it. Say, hey, you know, how you doing? Check in with your neighbors and, uh, you know, point them to us. We'll set you straight. Mike, any parting words? No, I just appreciate you giving us this platform to talk about what we do. This is something completely different for those that are listening, whether you're pro-gun, whether you're gun neutral or even anti-gun, right? If you just hate guns, you want them to go away because you don't want to see people hurt. We understand that. But I really think you should look into the organization because it's a different look. It breaks out of the same old rut that it seems like both sides have been in for 20 years. But thank you for having us on. I appreciate it. Go to at Walk the Talk US on social media. You can see kind of a three-year history where we started and where we're at now. And thank you. All right. Well, my pleasure. Thanks to both of you gentlemen for your time today and for this work you're doing that where you are genuinely filling a gap. Nobody was doing it. We have a lot of libertarian podcasts and blogs on general topics, but I don't think we had anything on this until you guys came along. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. It's uh, it's great. And thank you for the work you do. You're a, you're a beacon in the darkness to a lot of us. So appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, that's our episode for today. Remember, I am having a small event, necessarily small because of the venue. 
in the penthouse of a major hotel on the Las Vegas Strip, February 15th, 2022, for Angela McArdle. I'm hosting a meet and greet and fundraiser for her, for her race for chair of the Libertarian Party, so that it will be much, much less embarrassing than it's been and much stronger of a voice against ongoing COVID madness. And to me, it's important for any organization that has a microphone of any kind to be sound on this. And here's our opportunity to make sure that the LP is. So I would be delighted if you can join me. Even if you can't join me, you can still make a donation at the link. And the link is tomwoods.com slash Angela. You know Angela from the Tom Woods Show. And of course, she was also one of my special guests at the 2000th episode of the Tom Woods Show that we held in Orlando. So check that out, tomwoods.com slash Angela, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.